Okay, hello everyone. Kai, is it okay? You can hear? Yes, we can. I can put it this way. We'll take you as a valid representative from everyone that's on the line. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Beatty. I am uh, the professor for infrastructure management at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. I'm also the principal investigator for the module in SCL Global called uh, Adaptive Mobility Land Use and Infrastructure uh, or our um, In my overture, the overture for our module, I want to give you an idea of what we're what we've started and what we're doing, going to be doing over the next uh, two and a half, uh, three and a half years. This is the first pickup. There we go. We have overcome people coming in. So obviously you're leading a, a module or some, I am one of the principal investigators. I have another principal investigator and this is Pratik Banzo that you see here at the National University of Singapore. He's sitting in the room. I can see him. He's just standing up. Um, but uh, as it is a module, there are a lot of people involved in it. Um, so all of the research that I'm going to give you an overview of is not something that I'm doing all myself by any means. Um, in addition to the two principal investigators in our module, uh, we have three co-investigators. Uh, they include Dr. Or Professor Kai Axhausen, who's online over there. You can see him on the right hand side of the screen. We have uh, Bija Fuhi, who is in uh, Hiroshima University. Uh, some of you might have known him before because he was at FCL before. And Tanvi uh, Mahesh Wari, who used to be here uh, for many years, but is now based at Monash University in Australia. Uh, as we are the principal and co-investigators, uh, we need uh, a few people to keep uh, everything running on a daily basis. Uh, this includes our coordinator, uh, Chi Ming Yi, who's uh, sitting here in front, and um, Dr. Karen Du, who is also. Um, in addition to that, we have five uh, doctoral students, uh, Orlando Roman and Arno Elverson, who are physically sitting in uh, Zurich working on their doctoral degrees. Uh, and we have uh, Jin Yap, who is here today as well, who is here in Singapore, but is doing the doctoral degree at the TH in Switzerland. And we have Aranda Du and Suhan Yin, who are both doing the doctorates here. And uh, has kindly helped set up everything today. And um, Suhan is currently in Indonesia. So that's our team. Uh, the presentation, uh, I've broken it into four different parts. Uh, background and research goals. Um, part one is about improving planning processes. Part two is on improving the models that go into improving the responsiveness of these planning processes and meeting stakeholder needs via adaptive planning. And part three is improving our understanding of mobility needs through behavior surveys and analysis of results. So first, a bit about what are we doing? Um, why are we doing this research? Well, first, um, we have infrastructure. Our societies work the way they do because we have infrastructure that works the way it does. That's how we built it. Um, our needs for infrastructure, though, are not static. They change constantly. And one of the reasons they change, which is in the news every day uh, now, are bad things that happen due to climate change, um, extreme weather events, the forest fires in Hawaii, the cyclones that happen, the strange snowfalls that we have in different parts of the world, the mudslides, the floods. Um, but these are not the only reasons that we have to change your infrastructure to prevent, to prevent uh, it from having problems from these natural hazards. We also have to change it because um, we're changing. Um, our de demographics are changing. People are getting older and older people um, want different things from infrastructure than younger people. 
Uh, we have more people in different areas uh, and fewer people in other areas. And we have different needs in terms of land. So we try to densify some areas, we try to get out other areas. We also have questions coming up about what or how we should set up an infrastructure taking into consideration that there are new emerging technologies like our automated vehicle stuff. Um, how much are we going to be using electric vehicles? Are benzene and diesel going to stop completely? And if they are, when will that happen? Are we talking in 10 years, 20 years, 30 or 50? Um, we have these events like COVID that happen, which has exacerbated perhaps longer term trends like working from home. But at trying to estimate what these things mean in terms of mobility patterns is hard. Um, but we do, and we need to try to do it. And however it happens, it has ramifications of what infrastructure um, we need and how we'll modify it to ensure that we keep having it suited to provide the service that we want in the future. In addition to these things, we also are changing as people, and we just have new demands for travel. We want, for example, more active mobility, something we didn't really want 30, 40 years ago. We didn't know that we wanted. We want integrated hubs, more seamless connection of things. We want to be CO2 neutral. Or we want road space to be multi purpose, to be used sometimes as roads, but sometimes as parks for gathering. These things are all connected with a lot of uncertainty. I mean, if you talk to everyone in this room or online, probably have they give you different ideas or, or estimates of what they think will happen at one point in time in the future. But for those of us who have to plan infrastructure, we have to have some way of dealing with this deep uncertainty. And that brings us um, to uh, what we're trying to do in this project. We're saying, well, we've always planned infrastructure in a certain way. But because we have so much uncertainty of what's happening in the future, perhaps we need to do it differently. So I've classified our big goal, or written down our big goal in this uh, module as being that we want to improve infrastructure planning so that organizations, or the process to do so, so that organizations can better, faster meet the needs of stakeholders. For example, reaching carbon neutrality, or limiting the amount of travel to stores or convenience leisure activities, such as promoted through the 45 minutes. This includes trying to improve our understanding of how the mobility needs will change in the future, how we can develop new models or integrated models, mobility land use and infrastructure, and how we can use these in planning processes and how existing planning processes can be best modified to consider these new models and these new models. So if you look at the right, I have two illustrations of what um, long-term planning has looked like in the past. We're trying to see if we can improve what that looks, like. perhaps capturing variations of what it might look like at different time points in the future. Okay, so the future is uncertain, and we have to figure out how we should plan our infrastructure. But we do know that it should be modified as a function of which of the many possible futures are. And this means we need a bit of a different philosophy um, than perhaps was done in the old days. We have to think about how we can adapt to situations that we can't predict with certainty. This means we have to commit. Now, to short term modifications um, that leave open possibilities for future modifications when they're clearly beneficial. We should select these right modifications at the right time, considering new information. So, adapting as the future unfolds. This involves considering how mobility's needs change over time, which in turn, involves considering how changes in the mobility offer affects these mobility needs, as well as how changes in land use affect mobility needs, 
and how the infrastructure we build also affects these things. When we have a good understanding of this, or a better understanding of this, we have to actually develop the adapt. What would we do in different situations? And how would we expect our actions to actually change the future? In that, uh, those adaptive plans, part of the key is the actual infrastructure modifications that we use. There are lots. I have here numerous examples that come from the master plan of Singapore. They include things like new ride infrastructure, wanting to have eight in 10 households living within the 10 minute walk from a trace. But there's uncertainty with respect to this. Where will people live? There are things like the transit priority court that are being constructed or planned to be constructed that are going to have continuous bus lanes and cycling routes. But there's uncertainty with how these designs should be done so that they will best accommodate the different types of vehicles. E-bikes, normal bikes, e-scooters, push scooters, and a whole array of different types of vehicles that might be on that. And what type of demand will this create? How big do they need to be? How many people should be imagined in peak time? So we use these priority. You can see here lots of different things, all with un underlined different types of uncertainties that are related. We should keep those things in mind. We're building, making these modifications. Perhaps another example of this would be the expansion of the railway networks. There are plans where these lines should go, and there was lots of thought put into where they might go, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about when should they be implemented and when should the railway station be open. This is coupled with where people are going to live and how they're going to travel. If there are big changes in how people are going to travel, so many, many more people on the railways, perhaps the railway stations need to be bigger, need to be done sooner than expected, at least in the original. Now, our framework, if I can call it that, is divided here into these three parts. Uh, where the first part um, is the improving planning processes, the second part is improving models, and the third part is improving the behavior surveys. So I'll go through each one of them. So let's start with this first one improving planning processes. Actually, I'm going to back up here for one second. I have part one, part two, and part three, but in a way, it's part three that we need to know first. So it feeds into part two appropriately, it feeds into part one. So it's definitely not a hierarchy in the sense of importance. It's just you have to have structure in some way. And I thought it'd be better for an audience to understand part one first, and then part two, and then part three, and working with it. But in uh, understanding things, it works fine. So improving the planning process. I thought you might first want to know what do we expect to be. And here's a list of some of the things we expect. Because it's a big project, a big module with lots of projects and lots of people. I can't promise everything will be done perfectly, or that there will not be more things that won't be added. But this is our start point. We are expecting that we're going to map the planning processes in Switzerland and Singapore. That's going to be done by Arnor Elberson and Jim. We're going to demonstrate the effects of meeting stakeholder needs more quickly. Or the responsiveness of planning organizations. That's our normal numbers. We're going to demonstrate how bespoke tools can improve the responsiveness of organizations, including models of mobility needs, mobility and mobility infrastructure, land use attractions. That includes Arnor, Jin, Orlando, and Chile. And we're looking at how appraisals uh, can consider non conventional benefits, something of increasing importance in this uncertain world. That's being led by Chile and Jin. So what do I mean there? If I take that first one, mapping the processes, here you can see that we have first work done in Singapore. We're looking at how the process evolves over time with all of the different stakeholders that are involved. I've drawn out there at the bottom that it's purposely smaller than you can read because it's not yet complete. I want to just demonstrate what the process looks like and that we've been working there more than having you understand each Task. We're doing this by reviewing the planning guidelines and legal requirements in Switzerland, uh, conducting interviews with different stakeholders in the process, 
mapping the tasks and dependencies. And we're moving forward with identifying which tools can be used in which parts of these process. So does the process need to be changed in way? And then advancing on to evaluating if these things can actually improve the process to make it easier for planning organizations to react more quickly to changing stakeholder needs. We are working with the hypothesis that faster planners uh, can respond to changing needs better, which would be more benefits to society. Obviously, there's an optimal point. Um, uh, there is a certain value in the planning process simply that they take time and involve lots of people that uh, help coalesce around certain ideas. I've shown here uh, an aerial picture taken from a, a newspaper in Switzerland, an area called Metzikon. Where there's a traffic jam um, that has been occurring for uh, multiple decades uh, because the land process has been slowed down so much that um, you can't get around to actually building the road that the highway that we need to alleviate this congestion. Um, that is in our test core or in Switzerland. Now, there, we've identified that there, there are key components to improving responsiveness. Um, I've just drawn them out here at a high level. The first is really flexibility and infrastructure. If it's built in a way that it can easily modifiable, like adding extra lanes to a highway or being easily able to convert a road um, to um, more, have more places if necessary. There's a certain organizational agility, the ability of organizations to act quickly, which is through that process. And there's an understanding of the different needs, which we learn more of through the many models that we're doing. Um, the specific case study that we're using in Switzerland is a corridor just outside of Zurich. So it's here off to the left. And it is the corridor that stretches from this town of Dubendorf all the way down to Hindenburg. Little bit further. The town I showed the picture of earlier is this little Betsy Kong town. The dotted line is this uh, uh, annoying little piece of highway that we have talked about to building for multiple decades. Um, in looking at this, we've analyzed the process, we imagined different ways we could improve it. And um, in the middle of this slide, you can see. Um, an illustration of what this might mean in terms of how fast we could do it in terms of here's the different benefit that we might be able to have provide, provided to the stakeholders along that court. And we're looking at doing that something similar, expanding that, of course, but then doing something similar here. Now for part two, uh, so understanding or the cognizance of the needs is where we can put in a lot of work since we started the uh, started our module. You can see them down here. We have different areas of interest. One is that we've been looking at how to improve um, modeling land use mobility infrastructure in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, looking at metro line growth, the dynamics of land use and population density, and that's with Orlando Roma. We have a very close to having it completed, actually, but a proof of concept here in Singapore uh, being conducted er, by Orlando Roman, Cantu, Chi, Tan, B, and Peter. And that is taking an area, having it transition over time as needs change to a car light autonomous vehicle and road have been able to. Conducted a charging example, sequencing of implementation of charging infrastructure. And we are aiming for a full demonstration of this. Singapore um, being led by Jin, but complemented with Karan, Tsukang, Lando, and Chijing, Tanbi, and Jin. Key to this, which I brought out a little bit maybe in the proof of concept, is that things change over time. It's all referred to as adaptive plan. Adaptive planning makes organizations more responsive. They can act fast into changing needs. Now, adaptive planning has a couple of principles, which I mentioned a little bit already, but we are committing only to short term, short term modifications that are suitable for many possible futures. We're leaving options open for the future. It's um, not yet clear what is required, and we only make the decisions when they're required. 
and we decide to implement modifications at the latest appropriate time. So it's more certain, but there is more certainty as to the benefit. This consists of this little circle here, which basically means if we're going to do this adaptive planning, we have to identify the process modifications that we would like to implement. We have to investigate how um, they would be implemented and how things might change um, in terms of mobility needs. But we have to then come up with the plans that we think we would then implement in these situations because it wouldn't be all of the possibilities that we want to go forward with. And we would have to be clear about which indicators we're going to monitor and when these indicators, the values of these indicators cross their thresholds, and we can trigger the actual uh, process to have the infrastructure monitor. Um, as modeling here is quite intensive um, to provide this uh, more information on the needs and the changing needs, uh, I just like to draw that we have all models kind of working along this lines for us. Um, we have uh, the uncertainties that we're trying to model going forward in the future, looking at things like population growth, economic development, technological change, land use, use different references. We're identifying different modifications that are possible, such as expanding infrastructure networks, um, making the things modifiable, integrated hubs, charging infrastructure policy. And we're trying to bring these things together in models. Um, to see how well our decisions would lead to achieving different societal goals, such as reducing the intuition of use. Uh, so what do these examples look like? Well, here's one. Metro line growth in Lausanne, Switzerland. Lausanne, Switzerland, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the smallest city in the world with an actual metro system. Um, happens to be not very far from where we live, so it's a very good one to study. And here we're trying to look at, or we have been looking at the interaction. Can we model, or how good can we model the interaction between the density of land use, um, the metro mobility needs, and the growth of the metro effects? And we're emphasizing, um, our emphasis is on the use of models to identify, identify which factors are decision relevant in the planning of our infrastructure. Um, if you look at the graph here a little bit, if I point it as really work, you can see um, purple line on the railway. From the lake at the bottom is Lake Geneva. The purple uh, line is the railway, and the blue lines um, are the metro line, uh, the three different metro lines, and two and three. And I lived in Lausanne a long time ago. And back when I first moved there, there was only Metro Line uh, 2 that only went from the lake up to the Green Line downtown. Nothing else exists. So over the last 25 years, it's grown and grown, which gives a wonderful example to analyze the land use dynamics population density. The red areas that are highlighted are selected strategic sites where the government of Lausanne would like to have one in the future. We can mandate, we can mandate where they live, so we're trying to see how good the um, growth of the network could be in increasing the number of people living there. And we won't go through all the details of the model, but what type of results it spits out looks like this. Where on the left, you can see a graph that shows you what would happen if there was no um, new urban infrastructure, and on the right, uh, if there was infrastructure. And uh, here, we look at uh, the effect on the x on the y axis. We have what is considered the effect of building new infrastructure, what it might be on uh, population growth in these strategic areas. And on the x-axis, we have the densification that we expect to happen. And the little points show um, the probability of achieving uh, our target population as a function of each scenario that we generated with random pulls to the different uncertainties. And you can see here uh, that uh, the top right corner, which is much bigger on the right-hand side when we continue to build our infrastructure, you can see we have a high probability of reaching the densification in the areas uh, that we want um, when we're building the infrastructure that we want, and uh, there's a much less chance of that happening 
to show on the left if we don't build the infrastructure, which is important as well. Uh, okay, that's well done. Our proof of concept, which is here in Switzerland, is one where we're looking at the interaction between the designation of neighborhood type and how that changes over time. Uh, with different mobility patterns and different modifications of the neighborhood, the infrastructure of the neighborhood. Here we have a particular focus uh, on the use of very complex models uh, where we draw out an agent based uh, simulation model called Batson, which probably most of you already know, um, which works wonderfully, um, but it's not necessarily conducive if we want to run many, many, many different scenarios. So um, we're trying to show how we could use maps in a detail level and map it over to a surrogate transport model that we could use to better evaluate the implementation or when changes may happen to the infrastructure. So here, a lot of the work is related to simulating the neighborhood with Maxim, developing the surrogate models based on Maxim simulations, and then identifying and evaluating the different adaptive pathways for transitioning the neighborhood from one state to other future states. Uh, this is the modeling structure, which on the left gives you an idea of things that we're putting into the model, like population growth, market share, sharing preference, um, different trips that we would imagine to happen, what our network fundamentally looks like, where the buildings are, where the transport infrastructure is, and then um, different uh, process inputs, um, including accessibility, walkability, the food oil maze, which means um, uh, pick up and drop off maze. For those of you who don't know, our posts. We're then using that information to calculate the initial uh, demand in the area. Um, we are running the simulations uh, to see until we get equilibrium in the different situations. Then we're taking the output from that in terms of traffic flow, travel time, and accessibility, and we're using that information to develop appropriate survey models. What it looks like um, is connected to this area, which is below the, I can't see it because it's fitness, but it's the Tanjanjan Paga region. So just below downtown, basically right on the coast. It's currently a terminal area that uh, is not yet converted, but there are plans to convert it to a residential area, or at least there were plans at one time to do so. So we took this region and we imagined uh, what it would look like as soon as it was built and then how it might be transitioned over time. Um, to do that, we looked at different types of network, network structures. We okay, would like to have traffic turning in loops or grid structure, or we had what's called a super block structure. Um, looking at different ways we can set up the pickup drop off zones, um, either having many all over the place or having just a few of them indicated with the red dots. Um, or if we allow. Huh, why? You call me Um We're looking at different parts. They are explaining some kind of. Yeah, concept. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. Just... yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. And we're looking at different inter intersection designs that might have a regular type of intersection, a bridge intersection, a scramble intersection, a modification. Our base case is that this one, just a loop network with distributed parking, no pickup drop up zones, and regular intersections. Um, and the setup that we have. Um, to give you a little impression here of the uh, result of work being done, we have the visualization of the bat simulations uh, that CAN has been working on uh, that help us uh, develop the base understanding of how everything works to get developed in Serbia. Um, what we might get out of this in the end looks something like this uh, the adaptive pathways. And here you can see, for example, um, Red, yellow, green, and blue are what we're calling the, the uh, there are, are different situations that we might have in our infrastructure. 
And getting to these requires the infrastructure modifications, but we start at the gray bit in the middle of the base case of the current situation. Down bottom here, we have what's called our examples of our indicators uh, in terms of population growth on the island, which is correlated with the population we'd expect in that area. Um, and what time that would be likely to happen with a slow growth and a fast growth scenario. Now, obviously, this is a very simple depiction of what it might look like. It's actually a very multi uh, surface type of uh, thing, but it's hard to visualize that. To give you a feeling for it, say, well, it's a current situation. Um, we'll have that to a certain point in time, um, which we can say is time equals zero now, and we should change in one direction or another. Could change up to sit up to the yellow line, which says, well, um, if we have a population of 4.5.7, um, then uh, we should be having perhaps a loop and loop structure in the neighborhood with bridge intersections. Over time, as we're going on, we will reach a certain population growth that will trigger um, a change um, indicated by the triangle that will have to happen, which and then there'll be another change. That's the red line to give us the super block um, configuration model with the few of the groups. And when we get our proof of concept completely finished, we'll have these uh, detailed uh, for concepts, but this is more of an illustrated one at the moment because we're not quite done. Yet. So proof of concept, that's the second place we're looking at improving models. The third place, uh, which we've investigated is this topic of charging infrastructure, which is quite important now in Singapore, as Singapore moves ahead with rolling out charging infrastructure, obviously connected with the situation of, well, how many people are going to be driving electric cars? And so, some people would argue that they're not being picked up as fast as people thought they would. Um, obviously, government has some control on that because they could simply stop selling benzene and uh, diesel. Um, that would, uh, everyone had to switch to electric. Um, but also, the further installation of electric charges also means more people would have to be interested in buying them. So, it's a very complex situation. We were looking here, or are looking here, at a modeling the interaction between the demand for electric vehicles, changes in mobility patterns, and implementation of fast charging infrastructure over time. And uh, we have a particular emphasis on the spatial constraints and different circumstances. Um, so how should we sequence their installation, considering the quantity, the size, um, and the time of installation? So for this, uh, we've developed a very interesting algorithm uh, based on AI. Um, say it's in the AI gym environment. It's depicted with this large graph here. It's considered to have two so-called super agents, uh, super agent alpha, which is depicted with the green um, arrow here, basically is looking at agent-based simulation, things like when do people do ride sharing, when are they doing hailing, the modeling of the travel demand, the travel demands and mobility demands, which are indicated with the purple circle, which shows when and where people will want to be traveling. And then we have uh, the blue circle, which really uh, is super agent beta, which has to do with where and when do you actually install fast charging infrastructure. And the um, algorithm that we're using is a reinforcement learning um, based tool optimization model because we need both sides. Uh, what type of results we get out of it are depicted here with a few graphs, uh, which I see some things a little bit difficult to see. But the very main graph uh, shows the estimated peak hour travel demands in uh, for electric vehicles in Singapore um, for one situation, um, because we have obviously other uncertainties that we've modeled in the situation. Um, and down uh, below, as you can see on the left, should be the same map, uh, different lines, but showing the differences in travel demands 
uh, like there's this many um, vehicles that should be there or people want to be there that aren't there. The one in the middle C, so the ones with the red lines show many years from now, in our simulation, what we would expect increases in travel demand, um, which in this case, it shows that their trips uh, periphery of the city centers, uh, which is related to a decentralization strategy. And then the last one, which is on the right-hand side, the purple one, looks at the increase in trips to the downtown region if we're having a different strategy as one of the strong cities. So these types of models help us understand the dynamics doing and hopefully should help us plan the future. Um, and to do that, um, it allows us to look through time at the different adaptation pathways, which are depicted here on the right. Well, we start with the existing charging infrastructure, which is at the top. Then we look at different decisions on the way down through this tree of saying, well, if we change the infrastructure, indicated by A1 in this way, and different things will happen and they change it again as A2 and then change it again as A3 and then A4 and so on. And all of this information helps us. Good. Part three. Um, so kind of the understanding of mobility needs that we need to fit into the models that flow up into the process. Uh, then we're doing interesting work. Uh, this is led more by my colleague uh, Pratik Banzel, uh, supported a lot with Kayaks House and they're online. Uh, it's looking at, well, how can we better understand what effects working from home have on travel mode preferences? Um, that's being led by Mira, uh, Miranda here, uh, working with Pratik and Kai. And the social travel behavior related to um, dining out activities. And then um, Another little, let's say, legal or a way to improve the data fusion or the database that we're making our decisions on, the data sets aren't quite compatible, is the data fusion method um, that's being developed uh, by someone working close to that team who's not directly, but worth telling you. Okay, so this first one, working from home and travel mode preferences. Uh, COVID accelerated this, but it kind of existed before anyway. There's a tendency for a fair number of people to, to want to work from home, especially when commutes are long. And uh, COVID showed us that a lot of people, hey, it's actually possible. It doesn't lead to many of the detrimental effects that uh, we suspected in the beginning. And because COVID happened, we have a wonderful way of analyzing what it might mean in terms of the dynamics. Now, obviously, if many if far fewer people travel, um, because they're working from home, uh, or they travel differently because they're from home, um, this has implications of what we should be doing with the transport of mobility infrastructure. So, to better understand, our objectives are to understand um, how COVID has affected uh, this and to understand how land use mobility planners are actually calibrating plans to deal with this. We're hoping through this to actually uh, provide useful information that we can feed into models that help us. Tell us what we should be doing. So we have yeah, a work from home scheme during COVID, which was one extreme. We have a new normal after COVID, which I'm not sure we've quite settled into what it would be long term yet, or maybe it'll never settle or just constantly change. But it will have long term impacts on that use and of transport system. So, how's that work? Well, a key aspect of our analysis is uh, our surveys um, that we're doing. Here I've depicted the analysis framework. And this left hand box here, we indicate that there's a lot of different attributes that we're trying to understand through a survey where we have respondents pick a certain profile. And these, this type of survey will help us understand the environment that they live in, um, how much they're working from home, uh, how much they're working in the office. Um, what types of commutes they have, uh, the costs of these commutes, the time it takes them to do it. And then um, correlating that with different characteristics of the individual, um, like what are they doing in their leisure time, how old are they, their demographics, and uh, how do they only uh, work uh, to communicate during, for example. On the right-hand side, we have the other aspects uh, related to uh, 
different travel modes? Do people use public transit normally? Are they sharing cars? Uh, are they hailing rides? Are they ride pooling? And we're trying to bring those things together. Uh, in this one. Uh, the little box in the middle on sensitivity is associated with the investigation of the system. Different differences in work from home choices also affect the choices on the right hand side. Um, for the second out of the three things under our part three, uh, we have the social travel behavior during dynamic activities. I mean, I think up until now, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to build models where people are going and when, and you can ask me where I want to go for dinner, and I'll tell you I want to go to one specific place, like Mexican food at Clark K. Um, but if I say I want to go to dinner with the chief, or a team, they'll have different ideas of where they want to go. And we might not end up at the Mexican restaurant, we might be able to go somewhere here nearby to here. And so it obviously affects the demand. So if you're trying to predict how people are traveling, it'd be good to understand this social network and how people change. And this research really is oriented on trying to understand that. Um, so how two households, um, different people actually affect the decision making where people go. And once we can understand that, we can improve our models. Um, a key here is also a survey where we're looking at these, these different uh, travel behaviors, planning of activities. We're looking at people between the ages of 20 to 60 uh, who uh, do not own private vehicles. Um, and um, we collect the data where different respondents are participating in pairs, uh, which provide an individual um, and group decisions when they're going to go for dinner. Um, and uh, looking at how these things affect that dynamic. In that survey, we're using a project called Qualtrics. And here's just an example of what uh, choices might be presented to people. Uh, which restaurants might you go to? What type of style um, do these restaurants have? So what type of food did you can be eating? How much are you willing to pay for things? How do you plan on getting there? How much is that going to cost in terms of real money and in terms of travel time? And then if any transfers are, which is a little bit related to your circular connection, I suppose. And to help visualize this, we have it connected with some nice Google Maps to give you an idea of the options. Analysis framework is set up roughly like this. Um, so on one side, we're looking at where individuals and groups would go for dinner using a multi-level path analysis with heterogeneity, um, and we're also looking at the discrete choice modeling using exogenous factors. That would be the left side and the right side. And we're trying to bring these together using an equilibrium, um, using user equilibrium, um, looking at where these groups will probably. Um, we already have some preliminary results of this work, which started quite early in the module. Um, we can already see that there are, well, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, that there are varying preferences and dynamics in your household to social travel behavior, of course. And we have identified that there is a positive correlation between social network impact and basically how flexible you are with respect to where you go. Suppose if I really want to go to the next restaurant, for so you can shoot me to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, our contributions are related then to uh, we think through this work is uh, investigating these heterogene heterogeneous preferences, inter household social activities, and decision processes, which is something that's not done before. It's a new methodology um, to customize survey questions to look at these things. And of course, we're hoping that this is going to better inform our plans. The very last uh, of these points um, is related to uh, trying to understand uh, populations of people um, and where they're going and when. And um, so one of the staples uh, of these types of analysis is what's called a household travel survey, which are done very extensively. Um, from time to time, because they cost a lot of money. This type of thing covers things like household size, type, in the income, um, but also gender, age, in a commuting distance that they might have, home vacation. Um, these things are very good, um, 
but they have some drawbacks. One of them is they're not done that often, so things are changing. It begins hard to update them. Um, and uh, because they're quite expensive, uh, things are, are definitely grouped together in certain ways for different uh, purposes. They might not have that spatial granularity that you'd like to have. And uh, our research team, being led by critique, has found a way to improve this uh, using uh, what's called passively collected data sets, basically mobile data, if I understand correctly. And um, there's a bit of gymnastics that needs to be done in order to make sure that things get mapped correctly. And the new way of doing this um, is uh, referred to as a clustering method. To help with adaptive fusion, just illustrated down here on the right hand side, saying that the big red bubble top, you can get stuck on the sort of demographic attributes from the uh, house and travel surveys. You have a non over completely, you have an overlapping but not fully fitting into that box um, data from passively collected uh, data. And you also have spatial attributes that come from both, but you have a lot more coming from the past and collected data than you have in the household data surveys. But if you're smart about it, luckily we are, uh, you can bring these things together um, and you can um, update the data set in very useful ways. And um, the wonderful mathematical or depiction of the mathematical set on the design uh, side which shows you how you go about doing that. Um, so this is coming about basically by reformulating the data fusion problem, in this case, for the integrated existing synthetic populations into a cluster-based data fusion problem, incorporating multiple low-dimensional optimization sub-problems. And we are using a hill climbing model. This is giving us results uh, like those shown on the right-hand side. Um, which enhance the data sets, which you can see a little bit like um, observed from the household data set. You can see the dots with the blue ring around them. And with the enhancement, you can see all of the other little dots that do not have the blue around them. And you can already see there that this gives you a much richer data set if you want to analyze uh, mobility patterns, which would then be in the models so you can help people make decisions that they're supposed to be. And so we think here that we're getting the, this is the very first exploitation of benefits of both data sets. So it's something brand new. And it's giving us novel insights uh, for data fusion to deal with this uh, an issue related to the low spatial heterogeneity. So basically, not that much difference all across the space um, in a population synthesis. Um, in a way, it's very useful. And of course, it's going to have a big impact in the future because we're going to get more and more and more information in this process. And it'd be good to really be able to aggregate these in a way um, to use them to make it disaggregate aggregate um, HMAs. So I say all of that. So all of that work, but all of those people comes together in us trying to improve this. How can planners actually make better decisions, and how should those processes work? Here in Switzerland, um, here in Switzerland being one of shown here, here in Singapore, right? This is one thing I said earlier that I forgot about, it is very big screen here. So even though I made that smaller than I thought anybody could read it, you could actually read it if you come close enough to it's very big screen. And that brings us back to this wonderful picture of Singapore where they've done a fabulous job um, planning infrastructure, taking care of mobility needs, managing land use over the last 60 years. Um, but hopefully all of this will help them go forward into the future, dealing with all of this massive certainty that is happening. That brings me to the very end of my poetry. Um, time for questions. If you have any. How much time do we have for around 10 minutes? There's a question in the chat. Oh, there's eight questions in the chat. 
All right. Yes. Um, so there's one question from online, Jude. And Shuram is saying that thank you for the presentation, very impressive. I'd like to know do you have any population model or do you planning to develop it? Singapore government planning to increase its population to around 7 million. Uh, and now, for now, it is 5.5 million right now. And these new people may be concentrated in one area or distributed in several areas in Singapore. Besides, people with different education levels, work, and incomes have different demand for transportation. So, is there a model that can predict the composition and the attributes of the population? That's a very great question. Um, I don't know how much you think it's said that, or I should turn to someone who might know more about that than me. I think I'll turn to someone who knows more about it than me. Yeah, sure. So, um, we had this discussion about the demographic model with NTA and URA as well. So they have some projections of uh, how the population is going to evolve. And they asked us to take up the job as well to see if we can develop the model. But it is requires a lot of data set which we don't have access to. So we will rely on their forecast that we do the forecasting using Max rather than developing our own model of how population is evolving. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you read out of the chat, but I can't really manipulate it very well. So, no more questions. No more questions. Right. Well, I'm glad everyone's. <laughs> so much so they won't ask anything. Uh, but obviously, uh, we're around. Um, uh, we'll be around for many years now, or at least a few years. And if anyone has any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to ask me or the critique or Jimmy or anyone else involved in the project, whether or not we're sitting here in Singapore or sitting in the East. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye to everyone online. Goodbye. Thank you for the presentation.